What's up, Resonate? Good to see you guys. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited that you are here. Uh, we are beginning a new sermon series today, and to kick off uh, our new sermon series that is, uh, is entitled False, uh, I want to do a little uh, true and false with me. You want to play a game with me? All right, let's, let's, let's do it. So what we're going to do is, is I'm going to give you a statement. And, uh, and what you're going to do is when I tell you, you're going to yell out either true or false, okay? That's, that's kind of how the game is going to be played. And so if you're ready for a little like mental gymnastics, uh, here we go. We're going to start off with the first statement. The first statement is this. The Bible is the most shoplifted book in the world. If you think that's true, say true. If you think that that's false, say false. false. Okay, man, that was, that was pretty interesting right there. That's, uh, that was a little closer than I thought. Okay, let's go on to the next question, okay? Next question is this. A kiss lasting one minute can burn 100 calories. A kiss lasting one minute <laughs> that is, <laughs> can burn 100 calories. Okay, if you think that's true, yell out true. There were some very emphatic truths there. I'm not sure where that came from. Okay, if you believe that that is false, say false right now. False. Okay, there, there too. That's funny. I've tried that. It does not work. I set my timer on my watch. Not 100 calories. Yeah, I, I think that the answer is this, that, uh, that, that if you're kissing for a minute, it's probably not. Well, the, here's the answer. The answer is false, right? Uh, it's Likely, if you kiss for a minute, what happens after that that burns calories, right? So uh, 20 seconds, guys, 20 seconds. Just kind of give you some parameters in your life just to help you out, okay? Okay, third question. Third question. First one's true. Second one's false. Who knows what this will be, right? We know one or one of the other, right? Okay, so the statement is this. A cat has 32 muscles in their ear. A cat has 32 muscles in their ear. Okay, if you think that's true, Say true right now. If you think that's false, say false right now. Okay, not, not, as, not as many people believe that a cat does not have 32 ears. The real answer is this. Who gives a rip how many muscles are in a cat's ear? That's really the answer, right? Why are we thinking about what has, uh, how many muscles a cat's ear has, right? Here's the reality. We, we do all that, and that's really fun, uh, because here's the truth. Here's the point. Sometimes for us, it's difficult to know what is true and what is false. Sometimes that's a tricky thing. And as we begin to think about it, I know it's a fun game to try to figure out what do we believe about this? What do we think about this? But the truth is that sometimes in our lives, and we're going to be pressing into some stuff, um, it, it's difficult to figure out what is true and what is false, what is up and down, what is right and what is wrong. And this is the kind of the thing that we're going to be dealing with. This series, uh, what we're dealing with is, is something that we have never, ever talked specifically specifically about in the history of Resonate Church and, uh, and, and something that I'm a bit uncomfortable about. If you know me, I, I'm a bit uncomfortable with the topic that we're going to be talking about um, because the topic that we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks is our emotions. We're going to be talking about our emotions. We've never actually talked about that. We've talked about what you believe. We've talked about lies, stuff like that. But this, this uh, next few weeks, we're going to be specifically talking about um, this tricky, tricky thing um, and something that I've seen devastate people. And I've seen too many stories where, where this aspect of our lives has really um, messed people's up in ways they never, ever saw coming, that they're kind of going about their life and all of a sudden there was something that kind of swept into their life and they didn't even see it coming and just jacked up their entire life, just messed everything up in their lives. And so in this, um, what I want to do is I want us to expose over the next few weeks um, some of these emotions that mess up our lives. Some of these things that are kind of embedded into our lives that, that really mess us up. And, and oftentimes we don't know what to do with them. And so we're going to be just heading straight for this and trying to figure out what does this look like as we begin to, to deal with this. And in this, uh, I want us to figure out um, how we address these things that whether or not oftentimes um, they take control over our lives and they lead us to dark places. So are you with me? Say, are you with me? All right. So that's not exactly that. I meant, are you with me? Right. Say, yes, I'm with you. All right. Yes, I understood. I led you astray. Here's what we need to be beginning to understand. 
to, as we begin to get into this, I need you to, to get two truths. One, that there's a private part of us. That there's a, there's a part of us that, that's the internal part of us. And then there's also this other part. This, the, there's this public image that we display. As we begin to press into what these emotions are all about, I, we need to dichotomize that. We need to understand there is an internal part of us. And then there's this public part of us, this, this image that we want to display. And every one of us has a filter between between these two things. Every one of us has a filter between what we think and what we say and do. It's part of how we survive, right? It's part of just living life. In fact, it's kind of normal. And if you ever meet someone who does not have the filter between what they think and what they say and do, it is a really entertaining and intriguing moment for your life, right? And most of the time, these kind of people can be found in like um, mental institutions or like um, retirement homes. These are the kind of the two places, and if you've ever been to one of those two, it's more likely that you'd be in a retirement home and, and kind of see what life looks like when someone doesn't have the filter between what they think and their public image and what they need to be able to display, right? I remember being a, a, a kid and us going, and uh, we were singing Christmas carols at a, uh, at a retirement home, and, and this guy, there's these two girls, and he looks at one of them and says, well, you're not the pretty one, are you, right? And you're like, how did you just do that, Right? And this girl like begins to cry and, and sh gets shuffled out by the sponsors or whatever. But, uh, but it's like there's no filter in that. And all of us are like, that just happened, right? There's this crazy moment when we begin to understand uh, what it looks like without us having a filter. And so that's kind of this normal part that that filter between the internal and the external part of us. But this can get kind of extreme. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. Uh, it was a few years ago. Uh, a guy named Jim Carrey, you might have heard of him, did a movie called Liar Liar. And, and really this guy lives this really duplicitous life. And his, his son, he has one wish for his birthday. And what he wishes is that for 24 hours, his dad has to tell the truth. And then the rest of the movie, movie is really entertaining um, because basically what it looks like is, is this 24 hours where this guy has to say all the things that he's thinking. And, and really it's, it's one of these moments that maybe it's your worst nightmare. Maybe you've had a dream about all of a sudden like you couldn't have a filter and what you thought just came out, right? And, um, and it's hilarious, right? Because this guy is thinking all these negative things and thinking all these inappropriate things and it's just coming out because somehow the wish worked and he got the filter, right? The magic of Hollywood brings us that beautiful moment uh, to be able to see deep within us this reality that there is a filter between the internal and the external. And oftentimes this filter, um, if we're not careful, we can, we can kind of master it and kind of get this thing where we understand that there's this internal part of us and then there's this image that we want to make sure that everyone thinks is, is exactly right in our lives, right? But then sometimes we have these moments where our filter breaks down. Where what's on the inside begins to kind of get on the outside. And we have these moments where we say things, and it, it, it might be statements like this. It might be something we say, oh, where did that come from, right? Or, or it might be like, that, well, that's not me. Or I can't believe I just said that. Or I don't know where that came from. All these things, um, that's just, that's, that's not what I'm about, right? And we see this all over Twitter. Someone, you know, launches a, a tweet and then, and then says, oh, that's not really what it's about. That, that's not really who I am. That's not characteristic of me and, and all this stuff. And what has happened is that filter is broken down. And that filter is, is part of what we begin to see. And what we begin to understand is what is going on underneath the surface. And there's always something that is going on underneath the surface. And sometimes we don't know what to do with this. And here's the reason. The reason is this, that you and I, we were taught to modify our behavior. We were taught to manage our words and manage our actions, but that's really where it ended in our lives. And this is just a part of normal life. I remember growing up, uh, I remember you might have done this. Uh, we, we TP'd, we toilet papered people's houses. And I remember as a, uh, I don't know, I was probably 14 or 15 years old, uh, we got this massive um, pack of toilet paper and headed over to a friend's house. And it was late at night. And uh, this friend had power lines that were in front of their house. And we thought it would be really funny um, to be able to create a toilet paper curtain. And so that when people drove by in the morning, they like could not see 
see the house, right? We thought this was just the most creative and amazing thing that any teenager had ever thought of, right? And so we, we started doing this. We were going back and forth and, and, and kind of swinging this toilet paper back and forth across the, uh, across the power lines right in front of their house. As we were doing this, um, a, a crew from the, uh, from the local uh, power company was, was coming by. They were out on the call, evidently, and they saw what we were doing. And all of a sudden, um, this truck, you know, massive crane truck, it was driving by. And then all of a sudden, we hear the screeching of tires. And then that beep, 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 and they begin to back up. And um, we were, like, a little bit confused because we were like, are these authoritative figures? Should we run? Or are these just people that are interested because of how massively creative we are right now, right? <laughs> And so they get out of their uh, truck and they, um, they make a beeline to us and then they just start yelling at us. And, um, and I remember them like, calm down, man, calm down. This is, this is, you're going to get us in trouble. You don't yell in places like this. This is the middle of the night and their parents are going to wake up, right? And they're all going off on the, on the humidity in the air and its ability to travel through wet tissue and that we were going to kill people and we're going to shock the, like, and it was just like, whoa, man, this is just toilet paper. It's like, chill out. And so they get these massive hooks and they begin to take it down. And we're still like kind of frustrated because our massive creativity is being um, thwarted. And then they begin to threaten and they said, we are going to, uh, we're going to call the cops on you and you're, uh, you're going to be charged with, uh, it was something like, it was like aggressive mischief. Like I've, I've, I think they're making that up. Right. Um, and, uh, and so we're like, oh no, this is really bad. So we bolted from the scene, but I've never toilet papered any other house. Right. Because there was some ramifications. There were some consequences to the actions. I thought internally, this was going to be great, but externally, when we got in trouble for it, like Never before, like, or never again was I going to actually to toilet paper someone's house. And specifically, kids, do not toilet paper in the nighttime when the humidity is at a certain level, right? That evidently kills people. I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, this is what happens, and we all have that consequence, where we have been conditioned to when we say the wrong thing, when we say this, this thing, that we will begin to um, utilize these, these filters to be able to say, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to change my behavior. I'm going to alter what's happening on the outside to be able to change. And we get really good at managing the filter. We get really complex filters that begin to add up. But here's the thing. We have to understand that there is something that is deeper that is happening in this. And that the filter, those things that begin to seep through, those things that begin to break down, what they do is they point to something that's going on. And this thing that gets pointed to, to is something that no one has ever helped us with. See, see, our culture has helped us to manage our behavior and helped us to manage our, uh, our words. But I believe that no one has ever taught us how to manage what is deeper than that, how to manage our heart. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus begins to say, you know what? All those things that are on the surface, there's something that's deeper that that's connected to. And we need to get to that. We need to understand that if you're ever going to see anything change in your life. If you're ever going to be able to live a life that is full of joy and satisfaction in your life. And so here's what Jesus does. He begins to unpack what it looks like and how we've been created on a much deeper level. So if you have your copy of scripture, you can turn with me to Matthew 15. Matthew 15 is where we're going to be, and, and this is going to be where we're starting off. And in this, what's happening is, is this, this whole dichotomy of the filter of what's external and what's the image versus what's going on in the heart. Jesus is like breaking this wide open. And as Jesus breaks this wide open, it is brilliant how he begins to connect the dots to something that is really significant in our lives. See, what happens is Jesus and his disciples do something that violates the tradition that they have set up. See, they created rules to help them not break. They created minor rules to help them not break major rules. One of the minor rules that helped them not to be unclean was that they were to wash their hands from the tip of their fingers to their elbows every time that they would eat so they wouldn't be ceremony or ritually unclean. What happens is that Jesus understands that this is not the real rule, right? The real rule is, is something that allows you to... Um, to to, to be connected to God himself, but not the fact that you would just wash your hands. And so Jesus does not use the, uh, the image. He does not use the filter of being able to do his behavior right. And what happens is these religious leaders, they call him out on it and say, Jesus, you're not washing your hands. Sounds like your mom, right? You're not washing your hands before you eat. 
And Jesus goes off and he begins to reveal the difference between the outer filter and what's happening in their hearts. And it says this in verse 17. He says, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But whatever comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this it defiles a person. He's like, it's not whether you wash your hands. It's something else that is defiling you, right? For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. He's, he's saying that there's this outward public image thing. But really, all of that is traceable back to some place that is deeper. And this is what is really profound about this. When we see this, what we see Jesus doing is something that is, uh, it just changes the entire way that we think about this. See, Jesus, he connects our actions to our thoughts. And this is not a revolutionary idea, right? That what we do comes out of our thoughts. And now that we are, you know, the name of our species, Homo sapien, the rational one, right? The fact that we would do things that come out of rational thought. And we understand that. We understand that we do things that are coming out of rational thought. But when we begin to press deeper, us who are Homo sapiens, have you ever had something that you did that was irrational, that didn't make sense? Have you ever done something that, uh, that really couldn't be explained by a framework of logic? We all have. The fact that there's a lot of our life that when we think about the, de the decisions that we make, the choices that we make, they're not necessarily logical choices. That we, if we coldly analyze them, they would say that would be the logical choice. Oftentimes, throughout our life, there's all these things that we do that aren't logical. That they're not something that is ultimately connected back to just our thought process. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus is, is brilliant because he says all that stuff that's coming out of the surface, all of that stuff that's, that, that's part of that image, you think it's just a rational thought. But let me, let me tell you, this goes deeper. There, there's something deeper behind all of your thoughts. And here's what he says. He says, for out of the heart come our thoughts. See, see this is, he, he reveals to us, this is about our heart. Not our physical heart, but the center of our being, the core of who we are. And that is beyond just our rational brain. That there's something else that much of our life is connected to, that much of our life is dominated by, that drives a lot of what we do. And here's what Jesus is saying. He says, don't for a minute mistake this idea that we are just simply rational beings, that we just do things that are logical to everyone else, right? That this is something that there is another place in our life. There's a hidden chamber by which all of the actions in our life ultimately emanate from. He goes on, he says in, uh, in Luke 6, 45, it says, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart, remember not just the things he thinks about, produces good, good actions, good words. And the evil person out of the evil treasures produces, uh, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. This is profound because we, we understand rational we understand behavioral change. The thing that no one has ever taught us to do is to understand our heart and to be able to peer into our heart. But here's what Jesus says. What you do, your life, the direction, all of the things about your life are more connected to this hidden part of you, this hidden chamber called your heart, this, this aspect of your life that is dominated by not your rational thoughts, but your feelings. And there's all these feelings that we have, all these emotions that we have that change the dynamics of our relationships, the dynamics of our decisions, the dynamics of our lives in ways that no one has ever taught us how to manage. And so there's this out of control piece to this in many of our lives. And we don't know what to do with it. But here's what Jesus says. First of all, we need to identify it. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be pressing into these things. But tonight, what we're today, what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to make sure that we understand the whole process of what actually directs our lives even if we'd like to deny and say we are rational people that make rational things and rational decisions, some of us more than others. But I would say all of us at some level are driven by our heart. And this is what Jesus says. This is a normative thing that we understand that what 
our heart does, it effectively drives our life. And here's, here's the reality. If you don't know what's happening in your heart, your life is effectively out of control. If you don't have a handle on what is happening in your heart, your life is effectively out of control. You may not understand that it's out of control. It may not be clear to you that it's out of control. But oftentimes what we do is we try to cover up our hearts. We try to hide our hearts. We try to make sure that this is kind of either neglected or, or, or ignored in terms of the deepest part of who we are. And what Jesus says is the more that, that gets neglected, at some point when that breaks through the filter, and oftentimes this is with the people you most love, oftentimes it's with the people that you're most connected to, when that breaks through the filter, that is not a mistake, that is not an anomaly, that is the realities of your heart being made known as it breaks through the filter because we get so used to doing the pretending that sometimes we lose track of who we really are in the depths of our heart. And I need us to understand that this truth, that every word and action in our lives isn't random. It's connected to our hearts. Every, every word and every action in our lives, it's not random. It is connected to our hearts. So there's nothing that we say, there's nothing that we do that is a mistake. It, it really isn't. We need to understand this reality. Oftentimes we can think, oh, I just, I just made a mistake. No, your heart was being revealed. This is what Jesus says. All these things, they come from somewhere. And this is what is, is really profound as you understand this. Uh, when Paige and I, we were going through uh, some marriage counseling, one of the most profound things that our counselor said to us was this. He says, Keith, everything makes sense. Everything that we do in us at that moment is completely logical. That, that in some ways, we are the rational ones. But the rationality that we use is skewed by our emotions. So in that moment, when we make that snap decision, when we, we, we make that, that, that decision to do that thing, our emotions get a vote in that. Our heart gets a vote in our lives more than we think it does, more than we be, believe it does. And when our heart gets the, the, the vote, it's often the deciding vote in our lives. And it makes perfect sense. And I see this over and over and over. I talk to people after the fact of making a decision. They're like, man, it seemed so natural. It seemed so logical. It seemed like it was the right thing to do in that moment. And the reality is, is that we don't do anything out of randomness. That we need to understand that in this, our hearts, as they begin to make sense of our world, we follow our hearts in this thing. And this is the next truth, that we don't have to work at following our heart. It's natural. You know, you might have seen the posters, follow your heart. Let me tell you, that's what we do. We follow our heart. It's the most natural thing for us to do. We rarely, in fact, think about this. When's the last decision that you made that violated the intuitive feeling in your heart? Oftentimes, here's what we do. It's so powerful that we begin to twist our logic to fit the desires of our heart. If you've ever talked to someone who's fallen in love with the wrong person, right? And they make perfect sense of why they need to date this guy or why they need to date this girl or why they need to take this job or why they need to move here to do this thing. Like, it just makes perfect sense in their mind. We're not crazy people. We're people who are being lied to by our hearts, by the emotions that are ruling our lives that, that are holding us in bondage. This is, this is what we do. The condition of our heart affects everything in our lives. It seeps into every conversation, every relationship. We live, we parent, we instruct, we, we manage, we problem solve, we love all from our heart. We do not violate our hearts. Maybe you've seen that person that in that moment, you know, they, they thought they made the great decision. And then they get a shred of objectivity from someone else and they begin to realize, man, what seemed so perfect in that moment was a completely bad decision. We follow our hearts. And I need you to understand that because the, the heart is so powerful. The heart has such a deciding vote in the place of our life. If we don't understand what's going on in our heart, it is a scary and potentially devastating kind of thing. You might say, man, that seems really alarmist, Keith. 
You, you need to understand that, that if, we don't under, if we don't get what's going on in the deepest part of us, we're rolling the dice. Even worse, oftentimes if there's stuff that's lodged in our heart, if there's, if there's stuff, there, if we have issues, these emotions that control us that are lodged in our heart, these are making the decisions of our life for us. These are pressing our life in places that we never want them to go. This is over and over what happens is that we get these things lodged in our hearts. And we'll talk about four of these things uh, in just a minute. But we get these things in our, in our place, in, in our hearts, and we don't know what to do with them. We don't know how this works. So there is something that is powerful. There's something that is potentially illogical that is ruling over you. And so you must understand your heart. You must understand what is going on in this because it can destroy you. Let me give you another truth in this. That what is in your heart eventually works its way into your thoughts, your words, and your actions. <clears throat> that your heart eventually escapes. That, that no matter how sophisticated the filter is that you use in your life, eventually it gets out. Eventually it becomes uh, something that, that emerges. And this is what I hear from people as they begin to get married. And, and, and there's just something that oftentimes, if this person wasn't straight up with them, that, that they begin to get married and they're like, oh my goodness, you're a little bit different. Or maybe you were a lot different than I thought you were. Why? Because oftentimes when we get close to someone, the filter comes down. When we get tired, the filter comes down. When we get worn out, the filter comes down. And who we really are comes out. And sometimes that's really hard for other people to live with. Sometimes it's really difficult because when we begin to understand this, the secrets in our lives, they don't remain secrets. The things that are deep within us, they don't stay secrets. When something happens in our life, you can say the saying goes like this, you know, when you're bumped, what you're full of spills out and it's eventually going to happen. When I was a kid, I was, uh, I was absolutely just enthralled with Mount St. Helens. In the fourth grade, we had to write off to a, uh, sorry, the fifth grade, we had to write off to a, a state and request, uh, we had to request um, this like information and literature from their tourism department. And I remember ri writing to Washington and, uh, and it was so far away from Texas, right? And this is crazy. And I remember reading all this stuff. And the thing that I was so like enthralled by was Mount St. Helens. And this mountain, like this, this volcano, right? The top blew off of it and there was ash around the world. And, and there's this like massive uh, landslide. And it was like, it, I just, it was amazing. And I would read about this and I was just amazed by this. And then uh, later on in life, didn't realize it as a fifth grader, but I moved uh, to, to Vancouver, Washington. And I remember when I got there thinking, I've got to go check out Mount St. Helens, right? All the information from fifth grade is coming back, right? And I have to go out there. And so we went to the Johnson Observatory. If you've ever been there, it's like, it's fascinating, right? So you go in this and then there's like this movie and there's this like great narration. And at the very end, the movie screen lifts up and the curtains open and there is Mount St. Helens. I think we have a picture of it there. I mean, like you see this picture of Mount St. Helens and it is like massive and you're like, way to go Washington State Department of Natural Resources or whatever. You made this an experience, right? So you're looking at it and you're like, dude, that is, that is a missing part of that mountain. That is amazing, right? And, uh, and so I remember a few years later, me and a buddy, we, uh, we climb up, and, and it's one thing to look at from this, pos uh, from this perspective. We climbed up the rim, and uh, in the last about 1,000 feet, it's all uh, just kind of sandy and, and, and gravelly, and you're just kind of on your hands and knees. And I remember getting to the very top, and it's almost like you pull yourself up to the rim, and then you like see down in it, and there's, this, uh, there's another perspective that we have, a, a picture of this, and you start to see this like massive crater. And, and in this, one of the things I did not expect as we began to look in this is we saw this like this cone in the middle of it. So after, you know, it blew, there was still some lava that was coming out and it built this like little cone in the center of it. And you can kind of see it in that picture. And what I did not expect as I got up there and I got to the top of this was the fact that there was steam that was still coming off this. Like I, I thought immediately, this is a really bad decision. I didn't, I did, I, I'm like, this is, did this just happen on a Saturday, right? Uh, did, did this just happened just really recently. But you begin to realize how, 
powerful this is, that all of this rock is missing. But in that, that steam means that that magma, that, that, that lava that's down there, this, this water is seeping down into the earth and it's not that far away from something that's vaporizing that and creating the steam that's coming up. This reality is this. It's the same idea for us that underneath the surface, there's only so much that happens in our life before something breaks out, before something happens where it begins to seep into all the rest of our lives. And this is what we don't know what to do. We begin to try to figure out, okay, I need to build up the filter. I need to manage the filter better. But there's this stuff that's building up on the inside that's going to that's gonna get out. And again, no one ever taught us how to deal with this. No one ever helped us to understand, here's how you monitor your heart. Here's what you do with your heart. We've never been taught this. And so this stuff builds up within us and we don't know what to do. And ultimately it begins to make destructive places in our life become reality. And so in this, what do we do? What does this look like? A guy we talked about last semester, the most wise man who's ever lived, a guy named Solomon. He spent his whole life trying to figure out what is the key truth that everything else hinges upon. He had more wealth. He had more women. He had more power than anyone else who's ever lived. And yet he focused his life to try to figure out this one truth. What is that one true thing that you can understand the rest of life with? In Proverbs 4.23, he shares with us what this is. Proverbs 4.23 says this. This is what the wisest man in the world, he said, this, this, is what, this is this truth that you can begin to connect everything in your life to and bank it on. It says this, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else. He, he's saying, I, fa- I found it, I figured it out. The one pinnacle statement, the one truth above all truths, the one thing that connects everything else is this. Guard your heart for it determines the course of your life. All this stuff that's inside of you that eventually gets out. If you don't guard your heart, it's going to change the course of your life and you're not going to be able to have a filter that changes anything else. You're going to have these emotions that dominate your life, that dominate your world, and you're not going to know what to do with them. You're going to be at the mercy of them. They will change the course of your life. What should you do? You should guard your heart. Another one says, says it this way, another translation. It says, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. Everything that you do flows from it. This is, this is the truth. What are you to do? If your heart is at the center of everything that drives your thoughts and your actions, if your heart is that thing that determines the course of your life, if your heart is the thing that everything else flows from, and if you have grown up in a culture that have not, has not ever taught you to do anything with your heart, just begin to, to, to create the filter that manages your behavior, what are you to do? You're to guard your heart. You're to guard your heart. And here's what this looks like. What does it mean to guard your heart? It means to manage and be able to understand what comes in and what goes out of your heart. For you to be able to know what's going on internally in your life. And for you to be able to understand that these things that are happening, that are coming, for you to, be, for you to have a knowledge of what's going on. Because oftentimes we, we put our heart away. We, we don't want to figure out what's going on in our heart. We neglect it. We ignore our hearts and this destroys us and we don't even realize it. This allows these monsters of emotions to grow in our hearts unchecked because we're not looking in there and we're not figuring out what is going on. And so here's what I want to do. Over the next few weeks, I want to identify the monsters. I want us to be able to take and I want us to expose, I want the, us to out these, to identify them, to look at them, to be able to say, this is what's going on. This is, this is what is happening in our hearts so that we might be able to slay the dragons because here's what has happened, Resonate. I believe that we have become masters of pretending while living miserable lives where we're dominated by these seemingly rogue emotions 
and we're feeling helpless to change the cycle. And here's what I want to ask us as a church to do for us to stop trying to just manage our image and aggressively and courageously monitor and guard our hearts. To monitor and guard our hearts. And I want us to be able to, to expose these pretenders, to figure out what these false things that are dominating us really are. There's four key emotions that I believe hijack our heart, mess us up. And they do it in various ways. And it's all over the place. But I want to just walk through and tell you where we're going with some of this stuff so that we can understand if this is our heart and it's oftentimes being hijacked by these emotions and we don't know what to do with them, we need to first be able to identify. The first emotion that I believe controls many of us is the emotion of anger in our hearts. And anger takes this. It's, it's this idea that we are owed by someone else. Anger says this, that you owe me. And that you can be a number of things. It might not be a specific person. It might be life in general. But you are angry about something. You're mad about something. There's an underlying frustration. There's an underlying dissatisfaction in your life. And, and that when you get pressed into places, the thing that comes out is, is, is anger. That, that when there's a hole in the filter, what comes out is anger. What comes out is that there's the reality that there is something in your heart that is dominating you, that, is in, that is, you're in bondage to this. And, and you seem to live kind of this normal life, but then all of a sudden there's this thing that pops out and it is, it is not pretty. It's anger. You're mad at something. And for you to be able to understand what is it and for you to understand what's going on deep within you, I, I want us to be able to, to get in this and be able to understand this idea of anger. Another one is greed. Greed is easy because the, here's the helpful thing about greed is that no one believes that they're greedy. Now, people say, I have an anger issue or uh, I have a jealousy issue or a guilt issue, but, but no one <laughs> believes that they're greedy, right? They're just careful. Like, it, you know, this is just one of these things. But, but I want to tell you, this is one of these hidden things that control our hearts, that these actions, um, uh, that they're dominated by us having this, this mentality of entitlement. And I believe we as a generation are one of the most entitled generations. And by default, we are then one of the most greedy generations that there are. And this dominates us and we don't even realize it. We have never peeked into our heart and understood what's in there for us to be able to understand that greed has its clutches upon our hearts. We believe that we owe ourselves something, that I owe me, that I deserve this. Not only that, there is jealousy. Jealousy is this emotion that is deep within our hearts. And, and jealousy says this, that, that God owes me. That, that, that God owes me, that I should have something that I don't have. That I should have something that someone else has and I'm jealous of them. And, and we see this, if you've ever had this moment where you have wished for someone's harm, if you wish for something bad for someone because you are jealous of them, that where you've played the comparison game and found yourself lacking and wished that you were someone else. And that wishing that you were someone else begins to play havoc in your life. And it begins to, to really be this emotion that dominates you, but you never understand it. It controls you, but your heart You've never peered deeply. You've never managed your heart. You've never guarded your heart against jealousy. And it is creating the destiny of your life and you don't even know it. Not only that, there's guilt. Guilt says this, that I owe you. Guilt is a product of secrets. Guilt is a product of us being people who have too much pride to confess. And so we, we, we riddle ourselves with guilt and one of the things I've seen over and over is how guilt ruins relationships, how guilt ruins lives, how guilt um, strips away self-confidence. And we see all of these outworkings and we don't realize. We just think that somehow our thoughts are wrong. Maybe I should just change my thoughts about this and not even realizing that there's something behind it. And Jesus says, that's a heart issue. That there's something that's deeper than just your thoughts that's driving that. And if you've never opened the box, if you've never peered into your heart, you're missing something really significant. See, these are these emotions. 
that dominate us. Because we have a heart that controls us. Because we have been built that way. And I want to tackle these things. And here's what we're going to do. Uh, Another thing that is so common in, in our world is that we play the victim card. That there's all these other uh, things that have happened. All my issues are because of someone else's actions. And we say, I, I'm justified in my anger. I'm justified in my jealousy. I can feel guilty about this. I can be greedy in this because of uh, X, Y, Z. And we kind of check the list of all these things that justify our ability to, to play the victim card. And here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to say that that's okay. We're going to go directly at our hearts. And we're going to take responsibility at this because the victim card continues to allow to allow us to be controlled by these emotions. And you will never break the break the cycle of control until you stop playing the victim card and start taking responsibility that said it didn't happen from the outside. But this is a monster that is within. And if I don't do something to to connect the dots to what is within me, then I will continue to have my life dominated by this, even if I don't even realize it. And here's what this is going to look like. For the next few weeks, each and every one of these emotions, each and every one of these lies is going to be met by a new heart habit. And I'm going to introduce to you new heart habits to directly confront these heart issues. And so that if we begin to practice these heart issues, or sorry, heart habits, we will be able to take on and we will be able to be able to unhinge and to be able to root out some of these things that are stuck in our hearts. This is my hope that we begin to see this in a really significant way. And and so I hope that you come back. My desperate plea is that we would be a healthier group of people as we walk through these things in the next few weeks. Maybe you're here and and you're hearing this and trying to understand what this is all about. And maybe this doesn't make sense because many of us believed that that Christianity was really about this idea of modifying our behavior, about being good people, that the Bible helps us to understand what it looks like to be holy people, good people, upstanding people, moral people, right? I want to tell you that the Bible is not about that filter. The Bible is not about your behavior. God isn't looking at that kind of stuff. We see Jesus say, I'm going to completely reject that. Here's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at your heart. We have a God who's not impressed with the filter that we show, with the image that we present of ourselves. We have a God who looks specifically at our heart and says, I want to work on your heart. My hope is in your heart. My, my hope is not necessarily in your, in your behavior, not necessarily even in your thoughts. What I want to give you is a new heart. Ezekiel 36, 26 says this. This is, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. Resonate, this is the good news. The good news is you don't have to do this on your own. The good news is that you don't just have to white knuckle trying to get those emotions unlodged from your heart kind of thing to try to figure out how your life is not controlled by these things. The good news is that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to be able to meet you, not at just your behavioral needs, not at just your your, your thoughts, but to meet you where you need it most and give you a new heart. And so he lives a perfect life, sacrifices his life for yours to give you access to a heavenly father so that you might have a heart that desires beautiful things, that you might have a heart that desires holy things, that you might have a heart from which your life is transformed. But this requires you saying, I want a new heart. This requires you saying, I'm done with that heart of stone. I want a heart of flesh. And this is the beautiful thing that Jesus says. This is something that I promise that I will give you. That I will give you a new heart. But you have to want it. You have to be tired of it. You have to be able to say, I want to be able to do business in the heart. And to be able to understand what is going on in there. So resonate. I I want us to conclude today by asking what's in our heart and for asking what it is that Jesus wants to do in our heart and for us to courageously and aggressively go after what is going on in our heart. And so this might be awkward and this might be uncomfortable, 
but I'd like to ask you some questions about your heart. And I'd like for us to, maybe it's been a while for some of us, to be able to search and to be able to understand that we must root out the secrets. That we must, even if tonight is the last night that you have a secret that you're holding in your heart, that you've tried to cover up something, that you've tried to not let your heart be exposed because you know how evil it is. I, I want there to be freedom that begins tonight and continues for the next few weeks as we talk through this. So let me ask you just to go ahead and bow your, eye, bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'm just going to just ask you, if you feel comfortable with it, just, just to think through some of these questions. Let me ask you this. I'll just start off really broad. Is everything okay in your heart? And as I ask, as I ask what, is everything okay in your heart, is there something that immediately pops up? Are you mad at anything? Are you mad at anybody? Are you waiting on somebody to come to you to make things right? Are there things that come out of your mouth that you have to apologize for? Have you secretly celebrated someone else's failure? Do you have any secrets? Is there something that you hope nobody discovers? Is there a question that you hope that someone doesn't ask you? Is there something that you find yourself so discontent in? God, I want to pray for our hearts. But I pray that we would be people of courage that would aggressively say, I'm not going to let my heart be neglected. If it is indeed the wellspring of life, I need to guard it. So, Lord, I pray that we would guard our hearts because out of it flows all the decisions of our life, Lord. I pray that you would help Right now, in this moment, Lord, for people to have the courage to be able to deal with some stuff that's in their hearts, Lord, so they might be able to say, I'm not going to go another day allowing things to be status quo. If this is really what is changing my life, I want to take aggressive, immediate steps to be able to understand what is the deepest part of who I am and explains everything that is happening. So God, I pray that today, that you would allow us to not have a heart of stone, but Lord, to be people who, who ask for you to replace it with the heart of flesh, God. Make that who we are as people of Resonate Church. We ask this in your holy name. Amen.